This is the Scottish Club Rugby Podcast. The Scottish Club Rugby Podcast. With Stuart Cameron and Dale Clancy. Hello and welcome to episode 32 of the Scottish Club Rugby Podcast. And in the programme this week, we take a look back at the Melrose Sevens from last Saturday, the cup games that were played, and we look forward to this week's action, which includes more cup games and a couple of Sevens tournaments as well. And Dale Clancy is with me as usual. But first, the Melrose Sevens, a healthy crowd at the Green Yard, certainly a tournament that is not afraid of moving with the times, aiming at a younger audience with a party atmosphere, but also going down the route of inviting more invitational teams than before. Ten at this one from the 23 teams and it's at a bit of a crossroads for sure as to uh, which direction it's going to be taking in the future following the last couple of years. So Dale, first let's talk about the event last Saturday. Quality rugby on show from some elite players who ended up dominating the quarter finals with only two Scottish clubs including one Borders team getting to the quarterfinal stage. Yeah, first and foremost there was uh, a lot of good rugby out in display. I, I, I totally agree with what you're saying there Stuart in terms of the, the tournament itself being at a bit of a crossroads because there are some real good Sevens players out there you think about the first opening couple of opening rounds let's concentrate on Shogun you know Farndale, Dick Davidson you know they were all getting hat tricks in the, the opening rounds so they're they're elite rugby players in terms of that have been immersed in the World Series represented Scotland GB you know they've, they've, they've had good accolades in the Sevens game Playing against some of our local players that we've supported over the last, you know, the last kind of few months, and it's it's a big step up for those players to try and compete against an invitation side. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a big bar to try and get over. But I think there were some really good performances, like ties that stick out for me, where Jed Kelso in the opening round was a really interesting tie from a Jed side that hadn't played a lot of sevens against a Kelso side who I thought were going to be really impressive. You know, are going to be really impressive throughout the Kings of the Sevens. Um, you know, season, they're going to be a team to keep an eye out for. But as the draw started to take shape, you know, some of those teams that perhaps were favoured to go through did well. The South Barbarians were a really good, interesting side as well that I think were obviously the crowd favourites as well by the time they got to the final. But the the teams with the, the experience, the invitational teams, made it through to the latter stages and ultimately Shogun were just a cut above everybody else, just far too strong for, for the other sides. It was the same in the women's draw as well. You know, the... The Shogun side were got a huge win in the opening round against Lionesses, and then when it got to the final, they were far too strong for Hammerhead in the end. So there, there's a gap there. So how Melrose addressed that is going to be interesting to keep an eye on. Ultimately, as an event, like it was well attended. The weather was horrific. I think we've probably seen every single season on Saturday, but the, the, the spectators stayed there. It's another good event, but there's a lot of work to be done in terms of where it goes and how it evolves because it's got its place in the calendar because it has moved with the times over the last few years and it's got to do so again so what do they do going forward to try and continue to have a competitive tournament if it's one if it's two different tournaments remains to be seen but um, certainly the weekend it was good to see finally see Shogun go over the line they've supported the tournament well over the last three years so to finally get that win is is great for them. And they got the double, of course, with the women's uh, team winning as well. Um, surprise, I suppose, to see British Army go out quite uh, quite early on, uh, past winners. And, of course, last year's winners, Monaco MPs, went, they went the same way. But I think some people have been kind of saying is that, well, we don't know who some of these teams are. The OG7s, the Eric Little 100, for instance, and and a few others who we weren't uh, sure, the Assassins, people like that. They're just a name on, on a bit of paper. They did contain some very good players, but that message wouldn't have got across to the uh, to the public. Yeah, it's hard. I think if you're, a, if you're a rugby fan, I think that going down to the Green Yards on Saturday, you would have been impressed with teams, especially like say, OG7s, you know they were they put in a great performance. Lions obviously beat British Army. Um, OG put out Monaco Impies. like Monaco Impies strong. Like like their team on paper was immensely strong. So you know it was a big surprise to see them go out so early. But for me that brings part of the intrigue of the tournament is, is you see it evolve and map out. Like the game with the Army and the Lions, they took I think it was a nineteen nil lead and eventually the Army drew it level it to nineteen all. And eventually they just succumbed to a great breakaway try from the Lions. So, you know, that's that was rugby. That's enjoying rugby. On paper, looking at the draw, it's hard to get an attachment to a favourable team because when you used to see Saracens, ultimately when you when I was able to play against Saracens and get absolutely hammered by them, but when you're looking at them, you start thinking about 
Owen Farrell and you know the connection with the the Premiership team at the time. Obviously, those players weren't there, but you, you're thinking I might be playing against the next Owen Farrell because you, you've got that identity. So there wasn't an Edinburgh rugby, there wasn't Glasgow who've been there before. Scottish Thistles even had an attachment, I suppose. You know, Harlequins have been there in the past, and then even when you think about Stellenbosch and you know University of Johannesburg, Hamilton that have been there. These great teams that have competed at Melrose Sevens are now not invited. Having them would be a bit a better tournament, perhaps. You could still include them both. Could, you know, they have got two finals. It could essentially be three. You could have your your competition, your main centenary cup. You could have the women's competition. Then you could have an elite competition with some sort of name, because obviously the Mike Bleasdale Cup is for the women's tournament. The 1883 centenary cups for the men, but. There is something that can be done there because then there's something for everybody. The connection to the local teams, the growth of the women's game and obviously the connection to some top elite level rugby. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens but a shame. I think some teams as well, you look at Selkirk, played really well, obviously swept aside the home side Melrose but yeah, that was just a, probably just a bit too much for them when they came up against Shogun. So what about the future then? I mean, I mentioned it, it's at a crossroads. Can they go down a split route with a club tournament on the Saturday in a semi-pro or elite competition on the Sunday or even uh, reduce the amount of teams to 16 for a club tournament and maybe eight invitational teams in two pools and have uh, both competitions running on the day along with uh, the women as well? That's, that's a possibility because you've got the infrastructure in place which takes a lot of time to put in. Make the most of it. That's the route I would go down. I think that it has to be on the same day. Um, for one, I'm a real fan of the junior tournament. I think that, you know, getting them, getting the opportunity for to to play at Melrose Sevens under some banner um, on the Friday night is 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 great. You know, it's a really well supported tournament as well in terms of you know trying to start that atmosphere and and some people from the town probably will want to support that more than what the you know the bigger event is on the Saturday. You know, they'll be engulfed with people coming to the town to. To want to participate in the sevens, but for me that's the avenue to go down. And and unfortunately, who do you call? Like there'll be a lot of teams that perhaps won't get an invite. But if you if you if you find the balance between that club tournament and that semi pro tournament, then you're still going to have a a really good event. Like you think about Jed Sevens, and off the top of my head, Jed Sevens, People Sevens, um, Erlston Sevens, they're really well supported events. I think the other ones have probably. They slightly lost the kind of um, the the backing from their towns, and I think Peebles is obviously on the. It's almost in the same way because it it changed its date in the calendar, but the other ones are still really well backed. They're really good sevens, and they're just club teams. Maybe not Elston this year, but they're mostly just club teams. So, you know, the people want to come and watch that. They want to watch a competition. They want to watch people that they know. And I think if you separate the two draws, I think it might be more entertaining because now the gap is professionalism really sets in. Like, the club game is so far away from the professional game, it's unbelievable now. Like, we obviously, we've taken out our semi-pro level, and as spectators and fans of rugby, we can see there's a chasm in between the two levels. So, th- I don't think there's any any harm in separating them and having them as a club tournament on the Kings of the Seventh Circuit, and then also having an invitational tournament with, with quality, quality rugby. You'd be able to really sell that as a product and you've still got the same amount of teams you've still got the same you know drive and backing from the from the spectators and the people that are going to be watching it so for me it's a Saturday try and merge if you do split them if you can't find a way to harness them both split them and uh, do it all in one day and we've all seen the, the the social media there's been a lot of people who've been you know the keyboard warriors who've been kind of slamming the whole thing we're never going back again you know it's not like it used to be and all this kind of stuff but if they did go down the route of putting more emphasis on the local clubs do you think we would still see them back would, no. would they come back again no i don't think they would like i don't think that's the reason why people stay away like if you split it because they're saying oh it's not there's a couple of messages i've seen from even getting shared with me about like how it's not the same as what it was before and it was a great day out and stuff. Do I realistically think that individual will spend north of £100 to go and watch it because it's a club tournament? Definitely not. It's an ex- it's a reason to vent. It's a reason to, to moan. Like, it's a great tournament. Like, it's always, like, I've always enjoyed it in different guises. I enjoyed it as a player. I enjoyed it because I was a people's player because I got knocked out early so you could go and drink. <laughs> so I enjoyed the experience of going to Melrose Sevens but from that as well, like I've, always, I've, I've enjoyed the broadcast element of it as well. Like I've enjoyed being there and participating in the in the tournament and think, learn about the stories and learn about the teams. Like I enjoy that but 
do folk enjoy when you get a little bit older and you've got a family? Do they do they enjoy the same things and just going and watching rugby? I don't think it's the same experience. So I think they're hanging their hat on something that is it's it's just easy to it's easy to shoot at because Melrose is the beacon of sevens in the UK. You know they're they're the biggest tournament that we have, so it's easy to be shot at. But I don't see I don't think you would see them back if they created a club tournament and had the identity like they did before. So, no, for me, I think it's just an excuse to, to probably stay away, which is understandable as well. Like, ticket prices and the cost of stuff nowadays isn't easy to try and entertain a family or entertain yourself and do what you want to do on a on a Saturday night out. So, you know, there's a cost implication to it as well. So that's totally understandable, but I'm not going to be putting on social media. I'm, I'm not going to Melrose Sevens because I'm absolutely skint. But it's like that's part of it. Like you have to balance up what what is what is right and what is wrong and, and what you can afford and, and where you want to spend your money. But I think certainly we've all been at tournaments where we've seen, I mean, going back to what, 2011, I think it was, when Melrose won the last local team to, to get there. And when you do see local clubs from the borders doing well in the tournament, getting to the semi final stage, getting to the final, uh, which has been done, it's a bit of a rarity now, but in the past when it has been done, it really creates an even bigger atmosphere in the, in the stadium. But there's just that extra little bit of a buzz which makes the event more enjoyable for people if they know that local teams are going to be there or thereabouts in the final. Yeah, there's you know there's there's times that I've obviously seen Jed progress through the rounds, mm-hmm. uh, get towards the latter stages and 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 playing some of these invitational te- and running them exceptionally close. Same with Edinburgh, Melrose, Watsonians are a recent winner. So you do invest in that team because they're Scottish and you go, I've played against some of those players or you know people in the team. So you then become a bit of a, a bit of a kind of fan of that that team and support them on their way through the tournament, but you do lose that with invitational teams because they're so strong. The likelihood of an upset is pretty low. There is something to do there, but I, I don't know what. But essentially, when you do have the local sides progressing through, do you lose that if you just have a club tournament? Because once Peebles are out, for example, am I really that bothered if Melrose are going to beat Jed in the final? I probably am because I'm a bit of a geek. But for general people, they'd probably be more bothered about Melrose narrowly getting beat by Edinburgh Rugby Development Team or if they dropped in a Fosrock Futures team like that would upset people probably the daggers would come out for super sick so there's the, i think the, the invitational teams and we heard about there's australian teams want to come next year and what have you there's a cost implication there and i get it but yeah i don't know where melrose goes from from this point all that i know is the tournament last week it was it had all the things that were really good about melrose sevens a lot of things that potentially can be changed about melrose sevens and thankfully we said it before it's not my job and thankfully it's not but They'll be thinking about different things for next year because I don't think it can continue in the version it's got because we knew ultimately at the end Shogun were going to be playing Sunday in the final. We just didn't know who it was going to be. And the top half of the draw was pretty decent for South of Scotland Barbarians to get through once Durham Uni progressed. And that would have been a great story as well with the pre-qualifiers and things. But yeah, there's a lot a lot of change that can potentially come over the hill for, for the Sevens tournament. The other thing, of course, is is whether uh, the Melrose Sevens should actually be part of the Kings of the Sevens, because as we saw on Saturday, Selkirk were the only team to pick up any points at all, which were just three, which uh, kept them in the uh, second position. They got from 10 to 13 points. Kelso were at the top of the table with their two wins at the Peebles and Gala tournaments, 20 points for them. And then you've got uh, Gala and Hoik both on seven, Peebles six, Watsonians five, Melrose three, and uh, Jed Berwick and Embrackies yet to score. Now, this weekend, obviously, Hoik Sevens and Berwick Sevens, Saturday and Sunday. This will take us to the halfway point, in fact. Uh, let's not forget that, of course, uh, the other two uh, tournaments were played pre-season about seven months ago. So they are part of the 2023-2024 series. So uh, we'll be, at the end of this weekend, at the halfway stage. It's interesting, though, as well, because you're talking about the Kings of the Sevens and what, what Melrose contributes towards the, the stand-ins. You know, and before I was talking about tournaments that are well backed. You know, when we think about the amount of tournaments that we've got, there, there there's a lot of work still needing to be done. I think on Kings of the Sevens. I think there's been a little bit of a shift in trends from rugby fans nowadays. Like, we, there's so much rugby that you can go and watch and absorb yourself in. But you know, the Sevens themselves, we we keep regurgitating the same product essentially. You know, we keep just going. We'll do it again. It's a big social event for your town, which is great because they're community clubs. I've always said that. But how do you spice up the Kings of the Sevens? Because the spectators coming through gates tend to be dwindling. We go to some tournaments and, you know, the crowds that are there are, are, are lower than what I remember when I was playing. And it will be lower than what people who played before me remember as well. So 
you know, there's 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 a lot of a lot of work needing to be done in the whole Kings of the Sevens, I think, as well, because we feed off the fact that Melrose was the birthplace of Sevens. We then take a lot of pride in our Sevens product. The Kings of the Sevens is an absolutely phenomenal tournament to play in, in terms of a competition to play in. The tournaments at all, you know, contribute towards that, but you've just said it there. It seems an awful long way away the beginning of this season. It does because of the two tournaments that were at the beginning of this campaign. So, you know, a lot of teams change in that time. There's a lot of a lot of change in the teams, the, the the structure of them. There's still games being played, so it needs to find its place in the calendar. And I think that's half the battle. Once it's found its place in the calendar, I think it will be able to kind of sustain itself and grow. For me, I think they all need to be in summer. And you go on about double weekends and stuff, and the pressure on the players. One way that was brought in to try and change that was twelve team squads and more rolling subs. So we've solved that. So the squads that go deep into tournaments have the personnel to be able to manage a squad and go for those duration. We got rid of 10 minute finals each way in the Kings of the Sevens because that's the way that World Rugby was going. So we've done things to try and limit the burden on players but for me, I've never seen any real evidence of a positive change from moving it from April to August. But to have a product, I think it all needs to be over and done with in four, five, six weeks. That's the That should be the tournament that contributes towards Kings of the Sevens. Well, let's have a look at the Hoyk draw anyway for Saturday. It's uh, uh, four pools. Uh, pool A is Jed Forrest, Buttermuir and Melrose. Pool B, Selkirk, Watsonians and Gala. Pool C, Hoyk, Enbrackies and Peebles. And Pool D, Kelso, Heriots and Berwick. That tournament kicking off at two o'clock. And then on Sunday, a one o'clock start at Scremiston for the Berwick Sevens. And again, split into four pools. Kelso, Selkirk and Tyndale in Pool A. In Pool B, it's Hoyk, Jed Forrest and Watsonians. Pool C, Berwick, Earlston and Gala and Pool D, Edinburgh Ackies, Melrose and Peebles and uh, yeah we, we see the familiar names in there but we really don't know on a double weekend who's going to turn up I mean obviously the one thing we can predict is that Hoyk will be firing all cylinders at their own tournament and on uh, the Berwick tournament we'll be getting a, a development team You know it's something that's always happened in the past I do think it'll be interesting to see what squad Hoyk do run out at their own sevens with the big games they've got coming up you know they're, they're a team that's, that takes their own sevens very very seriously um, and rightfully so like every club does they take their own sevens incredibly seriously but this is probably the only thing that I think that Hoyk could take their foot off the gas and not be accused of looking to protect their players they went through the south all the Hoyk players got absolutely flogged to, to win that trophy Curry weren't in the same position. So, you know, they've rested their players in preparation for last weekend's semi-final, which obviously Hoyk won and progressed through. So this is what I wonder where what kind of squad Hoyk will play out on Saturday. This might be the one anomaly that we ever see with Hoyk Sevens, that they might play more of a mixed team for this weekend because there's, is there a requirement to have Jay Linton out there playing against Den Brackies and Peebles and then potentially Kelso in the semi-final and then playing a a Jed Forrest perhaps or a Selkirk in the final for me I wouldn't be playing him at all I'd be making sure that he was okay for the final coming up the weekend after so yeah it'll be interesting to see what squad for Hoyk run out at the at the sevens at the weekend so Robin Purdy and Ian Hurd as well as Ewan Welsh will be covering the Hoyk sevens tournament for Rugby Radio we're live from three o'clock then on Sunday we're at Berwick for their sevens tournament we'll be on air at two o'clock for that one that will be uh, Dale Clancy and also Ewan Welsh covering that one but let's look at last week's 15s games that were played a cup semi-final at Mansfield Park a win for Hoyk against Curry. you mentioned it earlier 16 points to three and another home win chalked off it was an interesting game after what's happened in the last few weeks and you know I think if we if you replay my spiel from the kind of aftermath of it all was the fact that there was pressure on Hoyk. Um, how would they react would be interesting with the, the experienced coaching setup that they had. I did say there was lots of positives in that and they've answered a lot of questions. I think it's a, a really good performance, I think, as well. There's a lot of benefit off the work that Matty Douglas is, from what I'm hearing, is obviously shown and replicated in that performance as well. So, you know, there's different facets getting added to their game now from the new coaching setup, but it's been based off good defence. They they. The, the win that they've got and we, we chatted about it after Melrose Sevens thinking back to their, their trip to Stonyhill when they played Musselburgh it was almost a, quite a boring game because they were just defending defending Musselburgh never looked like scoring 
Hoyt took their opportunities and the weekend passed, it was exactly the same. Hoyt are just able to suffocate teams because they've got such a big, strong, streetwise pack that know how to play rugby. And even like of Curry, Mar, those teams, you know, Heretz, for example, who gave Hoyt a run for their money, they've got big packs as well, but they're just not as well deployed throughout the whole squad. So... You know, it's great to see Hoyk progress through. On so many levels, it's great to see Hoyk progress through because a defeat sparks so many other conversations and probably doesn't allow people to move on where I think a victory for Hoyk allows a, a bit of the dust to settle. It allows the team that are in place now to continue and focus on something now that they've they've earned for this latter part. You know, getting to that semi, they get into the final and it allows, you know, essentially, look, I won't be around the bush, it allows Matty Douglas to move on because he, all he wanted was Hoyt to be successful for the rest of the season. They've now got two big 15s games. That's what he was aiming to get towards. That's what they've got. What will be, will be, but they've obviously got a couple of big games coming up in the next few weeks. And Graham Hogg, of course, who's been involved in the in the club for a long, long time, uh, doing doing some great work with the backs. Like Hoggy was always a really good player. He was obviously involved in the national setup and obviously the academies that the Border Reavers had. He's got a lot of rugby experience and he's he's hoik through and through, which m- most people from Hoik are. You know, he's hoik through and through. He loves his town. He loves his rugby. So you know he's he's well placed. There's a there's a rich history of the Hogs in Hoyk, obviously, like in that rugby club. So, you know, obviously he's he's great to have within that environment. But I said it last week, Roddy Deans has got great experience. So has Scott McLeod. It's a nice little recipe for a coaching set up at a club on the cusp of going into a new era of rugby again. You know, in the Premiership. So, it's at the coaching set up that will be going forward. We don't know. It might be based on the fact that if they pick up two trophies, they might have those conversations. But. Graham Hogg has been installed as, as head coach in the meantime and he's obviously been tasked with trying to set up that team in a really difficult time as well because to get the buy-in from all those players going into Saturday is, 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 a, is, a, huge, is a huge effort from, from Graham and the rest of the coaching team. So, yeah, a really difficult time for Hoyk but they've came through the first challenge and I think it, it'll help... Uh, ease the minds of, of, a lot of the, a lot of the people involved in that club. And of course they've got two weeks to prepare for the big cup final as well um, because uh, the other quarter final was played at Rayburn Place last week, Embrackies beating Heriot's 19-10 in the Edinburgh Derby so we know one of the teams who will be at Murrayfield and that's obviously Hoyk but will they face Embrackies or will it be a, a repeat of last year's final against Mark. We'll be at Rayburn Place, obviously, on Saturday with our reporters, Hugh Brown and Sam Matthews, covering that semi-final. Whoever does it, it's going to have two big matches back-to-back. There's going to be two massive games. You've got to say, Mar for me, still going to this one as favourites. Really strong squad that they've got, really good players involved. We've seen this season already, teams have a little bit of a break and come back and, and not being able to hit the ground running, so... Yeah, whatever they've got to do, they've got to try and make sure they don't lose any key personnel. But the first thing's first, they've got to get over the line. So either side has to win that game. And then after that, they can start to kind of analyse where they are, what personnel they've got available, and then focus on the game after. It's equally as difficult for Hoyk, because they'll just have to focus inwards and go, we'll focus on our game, because we don't know who we're going to play yet. So they'll focus on their game, work on their stuff, and then once they know who they're going to face, the week after can be start to fine-tune towards focusing on a on a big mar a physical mar side or an Embraki side that is pretty physical up front but like to move the ball as well so yeah it'll be inter- interesting preparation for both sides the league cup uh, quarter finals last week Burham you're 17 Newton Stewart 27 and Stirling County 7 last week 35 those were the games that were waterlogged off the previous week so the semi final lineup on saturday now will be last week against Alan Glens Falkirk against Newton Stewart and on paper that should be two home wins but as the uh, Premier League football last weekend showed us no such thing as a guaranteed home win is there Dale Arsenal fan here oh I know aye um, it wasn't a good weekend for me with the football with Arsenal up the villa yeah Arsenal and up Ross County and all because Rangers got beat as well so yes they did yeah difficult weekend not a good weekend really for you no uh, people's got knocked out in the first round my horse didn't win in the national yeah I've had a bit of a, a bit of a difficult sporting week are but you okay You're... I'm fine if I wasn't the last place I'd be is here um, <laughs> but yeah obviously going into this weekend I think you're right to think that the those games go towards the, the the home sides in those in those but I think the more difficult game will obviously be the Falkirk Newton Stewart game Newton Stewart when I looked at their team I did say they were very agricultural and obviously there might be personnel missing they've got a semi-final a chance to go through to Murrayfield they looked strong last weekend when I looked McCormick back at number 8 um, 
you also say Falkirk are going to have the, their personal back from the Inter District Championship as well. So that might be a little bit closer than what we perhaps imagine. But if the weather's fine, I think Falkirk going into that favourites if they're able to move that ball about. The Newton Stewart side as well, although they're big up front, they do have a, some really good ball players in the back division as well. But for the other one, the last way would be doing pretty well to get beat at home. To be fair, against Alan Glens, who have had a good end to the season, you know, Div- the, division below as well. Yeah, they, but they've had a good end to the season, some good results in there. Um, but I think playing the team that's finished second in the league above and not second by a distance, just finishing second, it might just be a bit too much for Alan Glens, but. It's cup rugby. You know, it just a matter of the nerves might get to last wade and Alan Glens might go up a level and it might be Alan Glens versus Newton Stewart in the final. But, yeah, it's probably looking like it's going to be last wade versus Falkirk. Although, of course, Newton Stewart managed to um, to get a draw against Peebles and beat Peebles and Peebles went on and smashed Falkirk twice. Um, so it's kind of like Newton Stewart have been able to work out Peebles. Can they work out Falkirk as well the way that Peebles have? Yeah, it's clashes of styles. I think Falkirk, like when Kirkcaldy played Peebles, they were able just to match them up front. Peebles' focus has always been that they've been able to squeeze teams up front and pepper them. Against Falkirk, their backs weren't able to get the ball, but Newton Stewart were able to do likewise to Peebles and really limit them chances. Whereas when these two teams play, they're completely chalk and cheese. So... If, if Falkirk get parity up front, they have to make sure that they try and get parity up front. If they can get that and get the ball, their backs will start to carve open. But if Newton Stewart can, can squeeze them up front, get on top of them, limit opportunities, I think the big players like some McCormick, you know, they're going to be running riot. They'll be looking to try and get over that gain line. It was riot rugby from the Newton Stewart games that I've seen against Peebles. It was batter up, punch holes, and let's try and see who can run through them and just create chaos. And it worked really well. I think they'll have to do something similar against Falkirk. They'll have to really test them defensively. You know, you'll want McCormick probably running a little bit further out. There are, I can't remember if I've done my head, there are other back row players, but they were really impressive in that draw at the Gates. But yeah, it's, it's obviously, it's uh, there are two teams that know each other really well. Um, so they'll, you know, they'll be well versed going into this weekend. In other news, sad to hear that uh, Walkerburn Club have folded and uh, joined St Boswells and White YM in the borders in recent years, uh, disappearing off the rugby landscape. There have been other clubs, of course, around Scotland who are no longer playing rugby. For me, the sad part of it is they were announcing their 100th playing of the Sevens tournament, which would have been next month, and uh, they're not going ahead with that one either. If they were going out, it would be good to have gone out on a high with everyone supporting it, knowing that this was probably going to be the swan song. Yeah, there's a, there, I think there's a couple of elements of that. Like it's it, it's it's firstly it's disappointing to see any club go out, of, you know, go out of the system. And Walkerburn years ago were a team that were really really competitive with the industry that was in the in the village. You know, had a lot of mills, a lot of forestry as well, and it meant that the rugby team was really strong. But if, if, yeah, it, it's sad when you know obviously that they've got that rich history and they were going to be celebrating so many, you know, great milestones. This this year, and then celebrating their their hundred sevens, and yeah, it's, it's an opportunity to miss for the community. But it's also a sign of the times, which is sad in itself. There's not a lot there in that village anymore in terms of industry and personnel, and with a with a couple of towns either side of it that are offering. Well, I say three towns probably that are, that are pretty big in size in terms of the south of Scotland. You've got Peebles just up the road, eight miles. You've got ten miles down the road to Gala. Or you can nip across 12 miles to Selkirk. It's there's some big towns round about it that are finding it hard to get players themselves. Never mind, you know, one of these small villages. So it's unfortunate. The, the one thing that you hope is that the kind of school system and the, you know does help, you know, harness some of the rugby talent in the region. I played with a couple. Well, there's some. Real, there's an ex Melrose Sevens winner from Walkerburn and Craig Borthwick. You know, Ali Dixon once uh, obviously played at Edinburgh Rugby and. Has pretty much been accredited for making Marcus Marcus De Rolo famous. He, you know, they're for Walkerburn, really good rugby players. But you know, it's it's just a shame that there's not the appetite to play rugby now. And they've had different challenges as well off the field with their club rooms and some bad luck, if you will. But yeah, the the, the Walkerburn Sevens used to always be a great day out for um, players, second team players as well for for a, an opportunity to play a really well supported scenic Sevens. Just certainly just a sign of the times. St Boswell's is exactly the same. There's not a lot there. 
So the appetite to play rugby is, is diminished somewhat. You mentioned about the, the, the scenic ground, and it really is a, a stunning location for, for playing rugby. And, of course, right, right along the river, and many a ball has gone in there and been fished out with the giant net. What's going to happen now with, with, uh, with the ground, etc.? I mean, the, does it all get put up for sale, or does it stay, stay a grassland? Or What's going to happen? I suppose it's too early to say, obviously. But, but I think that's part of the problem. I think the club rooms is... is I think there was an agreement in, in, in Mockaburn have been unlucky. I think in terms of understanding their rights for their club rooms and I think it's obviously it's in the hands of others you probably drive by and see sheep grazing on it in July in August time it's it's that sort of land that's got a bit of a multi-use and then it became a rugby field for most of the season when when the rugby was on but you know obviously there's a big drive and loads of different things like fishing is very popular in Walkerburn I wouldn't be surprised if you'd seen that changed into some sort of setup for a little fishing village or something down there in terms of tourism for that village because that bit especially, you know, it is a really nice spot on the Scottish borders, especially on that trunk road when you've got the cycling up the road and Peebles and Ellethan and, you know, you've got good opportunities to fish in, in Walkerburn. It's a really nice part. So it's going to change into something else, but unfortunately for us, it's it's not going to be rugby. Well, that's just about it for today. Do join us on Rugby Radio at rugbyradio.co.uk on Saturday at 3 o'clock and Sunday at 2 for coverage of the Hoyke and Berwick Sevens, respectively, and also the Cup semi-final on Saturday between Edinburgh Ackies and Mar from Rayburn Place. But from Dale Clancy and myself, bye for now.